So first I would like to introduce myself. My name is Vladimir Boka. I am a clinical neurologist, physician from the Neuromuscular Disease Unit at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I would like to thanks for the invitation for participation in this conference. The ADSD conference is one of the most important uh, regarding inherited metabolic disorders. And it's such a great pleasure to join here this uh, event. So I'm going to talk today about uh, DB1 related disorders with a special focus in adult polyglucosan body disease and the main neuromuscular phenotypes associated with DB1 uh, mutations. I would like also to thank the APBD Research Foundation, uh, which uh, was really uh, great to meet uh, at the end of uh, 2020. And uh, now we, we can participate in several activities together and share uh, our experiences with the APBD Research Foundation. So when we talk about inherited metabolic disorders due to inborn errors of metabolism, we are talking about a complex group of genetic diseases which involve different parts of the human metabolism. So it is quite difficult to, in a first approach, to quickly define the involved pathway in the complex uh, group of pathways involved in metabolism. So, uh, during the, the two or three last decades, there were several classifications which tried to group the different disorders classified as inherited metabolic disorders. The main approach was given by Professor Sodubo, uh, including a pathophysiological classification. So group one involves disorders which give rise to intoxication. So these patients have periods with uh, complex uh, and acute presentations during, for example, illnesses, dehydration, and other clinical uh, acute decompensation factors. Group two, disorders involving energy metabolism in which the patient frequently uh, has uh, mild phenotypes in interictal periods, but uh, during special catabolic situations, these patients present, for example, with acute encephalopathy. So it's a, a quite severe presentation in this group. And group three, with disorders involving complex molecules, in which we have a progressive or a rapidly progressive or a slowly progressive or a long-standing clinical course of disease. However, this group has, after the, the advent of exome sequencing and the other next generation sequencing approaches, uh, has had a great expansion in its pathophysiological basis. And the ideas regarding uh, the classical inherited metabolic disorders changed a lot. And there was a need to change the way we, we always look at for these diseases. And also to include other diseases which were previously not included as metabolic disorders. So in this context, for example, dysmorphic syndromes uh, like uh, genetic, conditions with dysmorphisms which were 
classically classified by the gen uh, geneticist or the pediatrician as uh, dysmorphic syndromes are frequently now included in the group of inherited metabolic diseases. And when we talk about uh, neuromuscular presentations of inborn errors of metabolism, the main presentations include metabolic neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, spastic paraparesis, and motor neuron disease. It doesn't mean that other clinical presentations will not mix or present associated with the neuromuscular presentation. But it means that frequently in the context of the special disease that I'm going to talk about today, uh, the main features, the cardinal features are mainly neuromuscular. So there is a special group in the previous SSIEM classification as the group two of disorders of carbohydrate metabolism in which uh, the unit five included the glycogen story disease type four. And uh, now in 2020, there was an update in the classification and the currently international classification of inherited metabolic disorders includes now 24 different categories of inborn errors of metabolism with almost 1,500 uh, 1, different conditions. So it is quite complex to define special groups, but when you talk about glycogen store disease, we can uh, readily define this, this group. So, uh, after this, we can also have a, a special view from the neuromuscular disease uh, experts. So, the metabolic myopathies include 12 different genetic conditions uh, designed as the muscle glycogen story diseases. This is described in the World Muscle Society classification. So, DB1 related disorders include uh, an expanding group in, of neuromuscular disorders, including multi systemic involvement, in which we can consider a uh, main hepatomuscular glycogen store disease. So, skeletal muscle, liver tissue, cardiac. Uh, peripheral nervous system, central nervous system, motor neuron, uh, cortical spinal tracts, uh, cerebellum, white matter, and even the skin uh, are uh, targets of uh, related to this disease. So the glycogen brain enzyme is associated with an important step in the biosynthesis of glycogen and the abnormal function or the reduction in the function of the, this enzyme gives rise to the clinical manifestations associated with the group of DSD type 4. So this is a classic presentation of a scheme of glycogen uh, biosynthesis, the branching mechanism in which the glycogen branching enzyme participates. So there is here an adding of the, uh, the three subunits of glycogen to the end terminal. So the alpha-1-6 linkage occurs at this point and the non-reducing end is uh, available for other steps. Currently, there is a large of knowledge regarding correlation of genetic findings or the genetic variants, pathogenic variants, and the occurrence of a specific clinical features. So, uh, genetic correlation occurs in several number of conditions also in neurology, but it, it is quite common in DB1 
to see some uh, genetic variants quite more uh, frequently seen in this presentation than, for example, in classical DSD type 4. So, when we talk about the presentations of the six main phenotypes of DSD type 4, uh, we see that we're talking about the main group of db one related disorders. However, we have also, as previously described, an important group of typical APBD, adult polyglucosan body disease, and a typical presentations of APBG. Specifically about DSD type 4, the main clinical phenotypes include six presentations and the adult polyglucosan body disease. The classic generalized severe and fatal so-called perinatal presentation of DSD type 4, which frequently presents with fetal akinesia deformation sequence and fetal infantile presentation. So patients frequently present with a severe clinical picture here with severe hypotonia and marked arthrogryposis. This is a, a complex condition which is frequently uh, diagnosed in the prenatal period during uh, pregnancy, but there is yet a, a complex feature uh, regarding a possible therapeutic approaches, even in these cases. The congenital neonatal, neonatal neuromuscular presentation includes patients with intrauterine growth retardation uh, and patients with extensive neurological involvement, including the neuromuscular involvement. However, these patients frequently do not show uh, the typical features of prenatal or neonatal uh, hypotonia in their previous uh, screening during the pregnancy. There's also the classic progressive infancy onset hepatic form uh, in which patients have progressive hepatic fibrosis and hepatosplenomegaly as key features, a non-progressive childhood hepatic presentation with mild non-serotic chronic liver dysfunction that is uh, uh, probably one of the most under-recognized uh, presentations of db one related disorders and the childhood neuromuscular infantile and juvenile forms in which there is also an important, important involvement with cardiomyopathy. Adult neuromuscular uh, presentations of DB1 can include two possibilities of uh, progressive and complex neurological picture with adult polyglucosan body disease, or even the presentation with uh, nearly poor uh, myopathic presentation uh, in the adult uh, group. So I'm going to talk now about the APBG, the typical APBG presentation. This is a rare inherited neurometabolic and also neurodegenerative disorder. The pattern of inheritance is autosomal recessive as previously described. We have an important clinical and genetic uh, correlation, and this is uh, in, at the end of a spectrum involving GB1 gene related disorders. There is abnormal building up uh, of polyglucosan bodies, and this leads to accumulation of the polyglucosan bodies in different tissues, and as a consequence, the clinical presentation. Is quite more common in the Ashkenazi Jewish and ancestry population um, with uh, important founder effects described 
but it's probably underdiagnosed and misdiagnosed in other populations, even with the recently described pictures from case series in other European and Asiatic populations. The main age of, at the onset of symptoms is during 45 to 55 years. Uh, most patients have mild symptoms after the fourth decade, and it, it includes a typical phenotype and an atypical phenotype. So patients generally present with neurogenic bladder, upper and lower motor neuron signs, painful small fiber neuropathy, autonomic disturbances, including also the neurogenic bladder, mild cognitive decline at variable degree, most with uh, moderate involvement at late stages of disease course, and suggestive neuroimaging findings as uh, leukencephalopathy. A typical phenotypes include early onset presentations with stroke and stroke-like episodes, diaphragm dysfunction, a typical Parkinsonism, early onset Alzheimer's disease-like presentations or frontotemporal dementia-like uh, presentation, and sensory motor axonal neuropathy, including poor presentation. So it is quite difficult to disclose uh, how underdiagnosed is the atypical phenotype. So I talk now about the neurogenic bladder because it is quite commonly the first symptom of APBD. Patients are commonly misdiagnosed as they had other urinary complaints, for example, other conditions due to gynecological causes in, in women or low urinary tract obstructive conditions in men, for example, prostatic disorders. So it is quite difficult to, uh, for a physician to consider APBD as a differential diagnosis at the first symptom of a suggestive neurogenic bladder. And this makes the group as a, as a whole of the, the lysosomal star disease and glycogen star disease really common, but DB1 and APBD are extremely rarely observed outside of uh, educational and research centers, so clinical awareness is really necessary and will make an important uh, difference uh, during the following years. So accumulation of uh, polyglucose antibodies occurs in different tissues and it leads to the clinical presentation associated with APBD. Even in populations in which APBD is more uh, frequently described and classically studied, uh, almost 33% of patients had more than one misdiagnosis before the definite diagnosis of APBD. So it is really complex to give this diagnosis. And specifically in the neurological context, we have multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and other leukodystrophies as the main sources of misdiagnosis. And this is important because uh, more than 90% of pathogenic variants are easily identified by sequence analysis. So all exome sequencing, which is quite uh, commonly uh, part of the diagnostic workup of clinicians, have a, has a, an important uh, percentage of positive results if the clinical features of APBD are 
uh, designate to uh, to the the group of genomics. So uh, this conversation of clinicians and genomic group is extremely important. This is the classical finding of uh, an intraaxonal PAS positive uh, inclusion body. The, the, uh, the polyglucose body, this is an inclusion body which is uh, resistant to the action of GSTase and it defines the, the characteristics of uh, polyglucose bodies. So polyglucose bodies have uh, specific uh, morphological characteristics and also histochemical characteristics and some tissues as the brain tissue or the peripheral nerve uh, can uh, give important clues to, the, to define the diagnosis of uh, APBD. So here I disclose, I show the presence of polyglucose body in the brain tissue. So this is uh, uh, an important feature for the neuropathologist. However, the finding of polyglucose bodies is not specific or pathognomonic of polyglucose APBD. So it is important to consider other differential diagnoses and the most important thing, the clinical picture with the, pre the patient presents. Neuroradiological findings are important and we see for example, at this picture, spinal cord atrophy at the cervical spinal cord region, cortical atrophy, a specific finding. So here we have uh, important atrophy of the medulla oblongata and the cervical spinal cord, even in the thoracic region. So these are findings which occur during the decades during the clinical course of the disease. However, uh, some new important findings were described during the years, and one of these findings is the involvement of the cortical spinal tracts and even the association of uh, hyperintensities of other long tracts of the spine. So, uh, the neuroimaging picture associates, associated with APBD changed over the time. And here we can see the white mirror involvement typically seen in APBD. These imaging findings can be easily misdiagnosed with other hereditary vasculopathy, such as Cadazil, or for example, with other leukodystrophies such as CSF1R or metachromatic leukodystrophies, X-linked adrenal leukodystrophy. So it is important to have the clinical suspicion to give uh, a specific approach to the neuroimaging findings. Here I also disclose the same picture with these, these findings, with involvement of both posterior and anterior regions of parietal occipital lobe and the frontal lobe. And here also uh, a large involvement with also changes in sinal intensity in the cervical spine region. And here, what is quite complex, the misdiagnosis with primary demyelinating disease, especially with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. So the need for uh, definite and specific biomarker of APBD will certainly give important clues for earlier diagnosis and management of these cases and also to early inclusion of patients in clinical trials. So the main differential diagnosis here includes, as I said, local dystrophies, acquired and inherited causes of small fiber neuropathies, 
For example, the painful neuropathy of transuretine associated amyloidosis or Fabry's disease, etiologies of long standing neurogenic bladder in my country, Brazil, specifically with a high frequency of tropical spastic paraparesis and primary neurodegenerative disorders such as the AOS group. So, early onset AOS presentations with dominating upper motor neuron involvement are important differential diagnosis, as well as the hereditary spastic paraplegia group. Here, I disclose the most important differential diagnosis regarding the leukodystrophies and the portion which is involved in this white matter disease, the hereditary spastic paraplegia group, and the large group of motor neuron diseases in inherited metabolic disorders. So, uh, APBD, DB1 related disorders are not the single entity which leads to the involvement of motor neuron. So it is important to know that the clinician takes a special look to other conditions so as, such as uh, GM2 gangliosidosis, for example, or cerebral tendinous chantomatosis, which are uh, specifically of interest due to clinical trials or even specific therapeutic approaches readily available. So APBD is included in this, uh, this clinical setting of HSP-like or AOS-like presentations. And so we talked here today about the complex way of DB1 related disorders present in the clinical practice and uh, how difficult it is to clinicians to give a definite diagnosis even in epidemiological contexts in which uh, APBD has been uh, readily described and is an important um, presentation in, the, in several differential diagnoses, but it is important to show in this presentation that APBD and DB1 related disorders represent a difficult diagnosis. So my take home messages here is are that DB1 related disorders are certainly underdiagnosed and may present with several different neuromuscular presentations at different ages of, of onset, even in prenatal presentations, including poor myopathic, hepatomuscular, and multisystemic phenotypes, and that APBD represents a complex inherited neurometabolic disorder in clinical practice, which should be considered as a suspected diagnosis in the context of autonomic disturbances associated with painful sensory axonal neuropathy or painful small fiber neuropathy, lower motor neuron syndrome, spastic paraparesis, cognitive decline or even dementia, and adult onset or late onset leukoencephalopathy. So I would like to thank here my group at the Federal University of Sao Paulo, at our Division of Neuromuscular Diseases, our main leader and center faculty professor, Dr. Akari Oliveira, and our uh, group leaders, which uh, frequently uh, leads with patients with inherited metabolic disorders, motor neuron disease, and several other uh, neuromuscular disorders. So thanks a lot. And I'd like here to disclose some pictures about my city. Here is Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo is the main city of Brazil, the most important city in regarding economic 
uh, conditions or and uh, financial uh, work is also the center here in our country. And here I present the starting region, starting unit from our university at that time in 1933 as the Paulista School of Medicine and now as the Federal University of Sao Paulo with uh, more than six units at our university. So uh, thanks a lot for this opportunity.